So my name is Krista Avro. I'm the assessment coordinator here at the Maine DLE for the Maine Science Assessment as well as the Maine Through Year Assessment. And today we also have with us our folks from MZD who are going to be presenting as well, and I'll introduce her in just a moment. Next slide, please. And you can go to the next slide, please. So just some quick mean science assessment updates before I turn it over to our assessment vendor partners. So just to let you know, for proctor training, there is a Spring 24 Maine Science Assessment proctor training video. If your proctors haven't watched it yet, that link is on our site as well as in these slides. And then there are also two assessment security webisodes that need to be watched one time per academic year for our proctors. They are the same as they were for the through-year assessment, as well as that security and data privacy agreement. If your proctors already completed that earlier this year for the main through-year assessment, they don't have to do those things again. Our paper-based assessment order form is now available, and it is available through May 9th, which is the last day for requesting standard and large print assessments. If you have any Braille needs, please reach out to me directly at the email address on these slides. We also have newly released items on our main science assessment webpage under content, as well as some supplemental text-to-speech guidance that I'll be talking about in a few minutes. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan from MZD. Hello, welcome everybody. So in today's session, we're really going to be um, featuring discussion around the administering the test session and um, making sure that you are able to set up proctor groups, access proctor groups, print out test cards for your proctor groups, um, know how to get to the proctoring dashboard and all the different features and tools that are available during proctoring and as well common issues that might come up and we'll go over some of those and we'll take your questions and answers. Um, but first we're gonna be speaking about accessibility and Krista will be covering that piece um, to just remind everyone about the accessibility features in the Atom platform and um, how which students are available to receive which accommodations and supports. We just wanted to give a reminder about um, district assessment coordinator and school assessment coordinator accounts. It, a little different from last year. Um, for this year, all previous user accounts were removed and that means that you'll need to re-log into your account if you had a password for uh, access to the system last year. That doesn't work when you first log in um, for spring 2024. Um, and so you will need to re-establish your account if you're a district assessment coordinator. Uh, it's based on the email associated with your school address for which you are the district or excuse me, your district address in that case, for which you are the district assessment coordinator. And um, you'll do that by going to the, the main Adam site, which is adamexam.com. Then there's a button there for you to select that you've forgotten your password and you'll be given information about how to set your new password for spring 2024. Um, and the so you've been preloaded um, in the system if you are a district assessment coordinator. But then DACs will be creating the counts for the SACs. So those haven't already been, the, the school coordinator accounts have not already been preloaded um, by MCD or by the state. And so if you are a district assessment coordinator, your first point of business is to create accounts for your school assessment coordinators. And um, there's information about how to do that at the help desk site, which we'll be talking about how to ac access that. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process. So DACs can create accounts for school coordinators and as well for district technology coordinators. And then the school assessment coordinators, once they're in, will be able to create accounts in Adam for a school technology coordinator. If you have a, a separate account for 
um, technology assistance. We also like to remind everyone that for this program, teachers do not have individual logins to Adam, uh, nor do proctors. So they will never be entering their email and a password that they've created. Instead, teachers who are proctoring assessments or other people who are proctoring assessments, they will be using a test code and a proctor code that are unique to each session. And that's a lot of what we'll cover today is how to find those and use those test codes and proctor codes. Um, we'll be referencing throughout this training session um, that there's a lot of information available to provide support for you, resources of different kinds that are on the support desk website, which um, you'll sometimes hear us call the Zendesk site. Um, the address is there on the screen, mescience.zendesk.com. This is a help desk site unique to the main science assessment program. And there's also a toll free number to call uh, that you can get someone on the line right away. And that um, help desk phone line is now open for the year for the spring assessment. Um, but also at this site, there's um, numerous documents that you can download, the administrative manuals, the technical manual, the proctor guide that we'll be discussing today, uh, rostering guide, all of those pieces of information are there for you to either read online or download as a PDF, um, as well as you can watch tutorials and uh, the videos of these training sessions. In addition, you can um, create a ticket, which is to submit a help form, request form um, online. Uh, we also have a chat feature where our help desk agents can do on-screen chat with you to assist you. So a lot of options for you to, to get assistance and support both before the test window opens and during testing, test administration. Thank you, Susan. Yep. So I'm going to be discussing accessibility features, and it's especially important that your proctors are familiar with both the embedded universal tools and then also the supports and accommodations I'll discuss in a moment. So within the Atom platform itself, there are several embedded universal tools that you're going to want to make sure your students know how to navigate um, via things like the practice test before they begin the actual assessment. And that includes things like flagging items for review later, changing the color scheme, the font size, or zooming in, flagging items using the line reader, and then response masking, which is the same as answer eliminator. In addition, a non-embedded universal tool that is expected to be provided to all students would be scratch paper. So this could be paper, individual erasable whiteboard, assistive technology device, and if you're using paper, it can be lined blank or graph. Any of those are appropriate options for scrap or scratch paper. So the next level up of accessibility features is designated supports. So designated supports are determined on an individual student by student basis, provided that the following two criteria are true. So a team of two or more education professionals with knowledge of a student's performance have determined that that support is appropriate for the student and it's consistent with their normal routine during classroom instruction and assessment. And we wanna make sure that any supports that we provide don't change what's being assessed so the embedded designated support would be text-to-speech and text-to-speech would read aloud all of the text on the main science assessment, as well as providing alt text for graphs and images and tables. And so this year we do have some supplemental text-to-speech guidance to help make that determination of when text-to-speech is appropriate for students. And I'll note here that this guidance document actually includes guidance for math, reading, and science for all of the grades to be assessed. And so if students have text-to-speech or read aloud as an accommodation on an IEP 504 plan or individual language acquisition plan, they must be assigned text-to-speech for the online assessment. For all of your other students, text-to-speech is gonna be an improved designated support 
for students who are offered the opportunity to access text to speech and or read aloud as part of their normal routine during classroom instruction and assessment. So if you're trying to determine if this is appropriate for your students, the supplemental guidance has a list of words at each grade level for each content area. And essentially, if an educator perceives that a student would struggle to decode two or more words from their grade level list, text-to-speech is then an appropriate designated support for that student. So these word lists are not necessarily words that absolutely will appear on the assessment, but they are content-specific words that may appear on the assessment. And we want to ensure that students have the ability to access the assessment, including these more difficult content-specific academic vocabulary words. And so you can see the example on this slide. Just as text-to-speech needs to be indicated in the platform, there are some non-embedded designated supports that need to be indicated in the platform as well. So the main science assessment does consist of three administrations that are 60 minutes each, in addition to a 15-minute questionnaire, which we call session four. So if a student needs breaks or extended time for this assessment, you do need to indicate that in the platform. Additionally, if they need small group or individual setting or a bilingual word glossary for multilingual learners. Some additional non-embedded supports that you do not need to indicate in the assessment platform. There's no spot for them, you can't. But you also de don't need to notify main DOE are things like assistive technology, medical devices, visual aids, auditory devices such as noise buffers, having the student read aloud to themselves, or directions clarification. Those are just a few of the things that you can provide and you don't need to let us know. So for accommodations, accommodations are limited to students who have an IEP or 504 plan. So this is our most limited set of accessibility features. And so American Sign Language is one, Scribe is another, so there are some constructed response questions on the main science assessment. So Scribe is an available accommodation. As well as some paper-based forms. So we do have paper-based and large print. And as I said previously, the order window for those runs through May 9th. If you have any Braille needs, please reach out to me directly to discuss those. And then human reader is available for the paper-based tests only. So to have a paper-based test, it has to be specified in the IEP or 504 plan that the student's assessments must be paper-based. And then human reader is essentially reading the things that text-to-speech would have read had they been taking the online assessment. So human reader is only for your paper-based tests. So before we go to proctoring, Susan, I'm going to answer the question in the chat about the bilingual glossaries. So bilingual glossaries, whether it's for our math assessment, reading assessment, and science assessment, have not been developed by the assessment vendors. And so we will provide a resource that we recommend, and that's the bilingual glossaries from NYU Steinhardt. All right, so we're going to dig into proctoring. I, um, as we mentioned at the beginning, we're going to cover a number of different areas that are important to be able to locate student proctor group lists and um, make sure you have the right test cards and manage the test administration during testing. Can you, thank you. <laughs> I was searching for my button. Um, so first we're going to talk about, there are different roles for different proctors. Um, there are the teachers and other staff at the school who may be proctoring the assessment, uh, just monitoring testing for the day. And um, as we already mentioned, they will access the proctor dashboard via a test code and a proctor code. And so they're uh, limited from doing other kinds of actions within the platform. They cannot create or manage proctor groups. Um, they will be viewing only the students that are in a particular session associated with the test code and proctor code that they've entered. And while they're administering the test, 
they have the authority to, to pause tests, resume tests and reseat students, either the whole class at a time, or excuse me, the whole proctor group at a time, or um, for individual students. And we'll be going over what some of those actions look like. District assessment coordinators and school assessment coordinators have a, a broader range of actions that can be taken. Um, they will be accessing Adam and get and the proctoring tools via their login. So using your um, email address and the password that you've created will allow you access to a, a broader range of tools where you can view and manage multiple proctor groups in the school or district, depending on um, how your log the role you're using to log in. Again, you only see the students that are you are authorized to see. Um, and you can create proctor groups, which we'll go over how to do, um, and manage existing proctor groups, move students around as needed, see their progress. Um, and district assessment coordinators and school assessment coordinators do also have the authority to pause and reseat students um, during active test sessions. Next slide. So proctor groups are created, the default proctor groups when you log in to an administration and see what um, students are listed in that group and if you're gonna launch a test, those groups are created based on the class information that has been created during the rostering process. So during rostering, um, student information, school and district information and codes are already preloaded um, based on what is in NEO and Synergy at the state level. And when you get to Adam, then you'll need to make sure you have put your students into the classes that you want them to be in. And then proctor groups, the default proctor groups are based on those classes. However, you can create additional proctor groups as well. And those of you who have um, participated in Maine Science Assessment using Adam in the past, uh, we used to call these, um, <laughs> I just like on the name, that's so funny. Um, alias proctor groups. Alias proctor groups, thank you. We used to call these the alias proctor groups, um, but they are just additional proctor groups. And um, you can use them in a variety of ways for convenience for your test administration. Um, some of the, the common reasons that uh, schools might choose to set up additional proctor groups is to basically take a, a subset of the students that are in a class and have them test together for some reason. For example, it's an extended time group. Maybe you just wanna make sure you know which kids will be on extended time, or maybe you have them testing in a separate location from the other, the rest of the class. Um, you might have a group of students that's doing makeup testing because they were absent earlier in the week or whatever that might be. So um, you can set up these groups for the purposes of test administration. They get their own test code and proctor code. Um, and a separate set of test cards, but they still are considered to be within the class in terms of overall rostering. And then when we come around to reporting, those students will still be grouped together with their original class, even though they might have been in a in a additional proctor group, different proctor group. And then um, if you need to modify the default proctor groups, which are based on class, you do that through the class dashboard tools. Um, and that's where you can add and remove students from a class. The additional proctor groups, however, are modified after they're created by going through the proctor group details page. And we'll go over how to do that, how to find that. So it all starts from uh, the administration card and you'll locate the administration card. There is one for each session. So as Krista mentioned, the science assessment has four sessions um, and each has its own administration card. Each has its own set of test codes and proctor codes. So um, you locate this these administration cards by going to your main menu if you're logged in as a district assessment coordinator or school assessment coordinator. The, the proctors don't see these cards. 
but DACs and SACs get there through your main menu when you log in that's on the left hand side. There's a section for test management. And if you click to expand that, there's a section for administrations and you'll see um, all the cards, they're based on grade level as well. So if you have multiple grade levels in your school, you'll see multiple sets of cards for, for each um, overall, uh, yeah, for each grade level. In the, on the test card, there is a section for proctor groups. And if you click to view those proctor groups, you will get the proctor group information or detail page. We can go to the next section. A lot of information on the proctor group detail page. So you'll have the, the title of the session so that you can double check that. Um, the name of the proctor group and the school, how many students are in that group, as well as the test codes and proctor group, uh, proctor password or proctor code that's associated with each of those groups. There's also a little thumbnail about the progress of the population of that group, how many students are complete, not started, um, the blue is in progress. And then you can also perform a number of actions for the list of students. Um, and you can also click to proctor the test, begin proctoring the test when you're opening the test sessions for the students. Next slide. So to create a proctor group, or manage an existing proctor group, um, you will have several options. So first we're gonna go about how to create a proctor group. Um, if you're creating an, an additional one there, uh, if you saw on the last slide, there's a big blue button at the top of the detail page that is has a plus sign and says create the proctor group. That's where you'll start and it will open up a, a series of um, fields for you to complete. And based on your response on a previous field, it will deliver a number of options for you for the subsequent steps. So the step one is to name your group, which I've done here on this first card or first screenshot rather. Um, we're calling this one a, a makeup testing group. And then select the district. And again, you'll only see the list of districts that you are authorized to see and the once you've selected that, and that's the, the third screenshot, based on the district you select, then you'll have options for the school that are associated with that district. You'll select the one in blue and then hit submit. Next slide. And that will then give you the option to add students. And there's a big blue plus sign that if you hover over it, a pop-up opens and tells you that's the add button. Um, and then that will open up a pop-up screen with a list of all the students that are in that school at that grade level. And um, you can add them one by one. Um, and that's the most common way at this point if you're creating an alternate proctor group is you'll just select the students that you need to. You can search for them if you start typing your, their name in that search box, um, it'll auto complete and you can locate students that way. You can also filter by accommodation to locate students. So if you know you're creating a group um, of uh, text-to-speech students and you want those all together, you can search, or extended time students, you can search by accommodation and it'll uh, shorten your list and make it easier to find them. And then you just click the blue button again to add each student and then create at the bottom. Um, I do see that there's a, a question coming in uh, about can multiple proctors get into the same proctor group? And the answer to that is yes, if they have the proctor pass, word or passcode and the test code. And so it does mean that you wanna monitor the distribution of those proctor cards with that information on it um, to make sure that only those people who should be getting into those tests have that information, but multiple proctors can get into the same proctor group 
and see that same list of students. Um, some schools just choose to put, you know, multiple classes of kids into one proctor group or split a group into multiple locations. There's a lot of scenarios, but uh, the short answer is yes, you can get into the same proctor group if you have the codes for that. Um, this left-hand screenshot is just showing, again, the, the filter by accommodation option in a little more detail. And once you've done that and you've added your students, uh, here I've added two students to this makeup testing group in the right-hand screenshot, you'll hit submit and that will create your group. So this top screenshot is showing that I've gone back to the overall Proctor detail page and I can see now that there is a new Proctor group called Demo Proctor Group Makeup Testing Group that we just created um, in our scenario and uh, no students have started the test. I can click to see those students again um, if I want to and I that's the bottom screenshot uh, with the detail of the information about each student, um, including their accommodations and uh, actions that you can take based on where those students are in the progress of testing, if you come back to this page later. So how do you get to the Proctor dashboard when it's time to start the test or if you need to modify things? Again, that depends a bit on which role you have. So for district and school coordinators, you'll be logged in with your um, DAC or SAC login, your email and password that you created. And um, again, starting from that uh, administration card, you can um, see the Proctor group details and get to the Proctor dashboard by clicking on the view Proctor groups button. While you're here though, you can also export uh, the Proctor groups. If you click on export, it will download a, a CSV file spreadsheet of the different Proctor groups and their details to your computer. You can also from this um, screen, go to print the cards, the Proctor group cards, and we'll go over those in a little more detail later in the session. Um, the screenshot on the left though, um, that's your administration's dashboard that we we're talking about where you can see multiple administration cards uh, for each grade level. There'll be four for each grade level. If you are a teacher or proctor or those that you've as a DAC or SAC have provided with a proctor card that has a test code and proctor code on it for that session. You will be logging in um, just using your regular web browser. Uh, that's a, a common question that we get. Do you have to have the lockdown browser to administer the session or to proctor the session? And you do not. That lockdown browser is only for the students and who are taking the test. Um, proctors can use any modern web browser to go to the adamexam.com website, which is what's shown here in this largest screenshot here at the center. And there is a proctor test button on the right hand side. When you open that, that's the lower center screenshot, um, you will be prompted to enter the test code and the proctor code. And as a proctor, you'll find those on the test card that you've presumably been given in preparation for administration. And the example of those test cards is there in the upper right screenshot. And we'll go over those in more detail momentarily. Um, when you enter the test code and proctor code and uh, select to enter that information, you may or may not get uh, be prompted to enter a, your first and last name as a proctor. And that speaks to the question we had before. Multiple groups um, come in. They, uh, If a second proctor comes in or you're re-logging into the proctor group, um, you may not get that. But if you do, you can enter your first and last name and hit go or save or whatever it is, that blue button. And um, then you'll be entered to the proctor dashboard.
And this is the view of the Proctor dashboard. Again, a lot of information. Um, there's testing information to make sure you're in the right session. And given that these sessions, um, there is a separate Proctor groups, separate set of codes for each of the four sessions. It's good to make sure that you're in the right one and that you're doing them in sequence um, and not doing session four before session two. Um, there's also information, the test and proctor code, easy to access right up there. You can print your cards right from the top of the proctor dashboard if you need to. Um, there's also then the main listing of the students in that proctor group and their status for testing. Um, you can filter, that's what the kind of orange and blue bar is there. Um, below the overall status bar that extends across the page and shows how many are complete, how many in progress, how many not started. But you can filter that list of students by their progress, again, to make it easier if you need to find all the kids who haven't started yet, for example, after some have started. Next page. The student information that's listed, uh, the details include the student's name and state student ID, the school, um, their, another view of their progress by each individual student. The status here can be submitted, not started, in progress, or no activity, um, and, or receipt, excuse me. And we'll talk about if the student uh, needs to be receipted, how to do that. Um, some other progress there, the, the health status is also submitted, not started, in progress, or it might, that one might say no activity. Uh, text-to-speech has a specific button for that accommodation, and we'll talk about using that in just a second. Um, if there are text-to-speech or other accommodations, there'll be a, a, a circle with a number in it, and you can hover over that to see the specifics of those accommodations. And then there'll be a number of actions available through the action buttons, and we'll go through those. Next screen. So one thing we recommend um, there at the top of the list, there are a couple of buttons that are related to refreshing the screen. Um, because we are tracking students' progress through the test in real time, um, but the what appears on the screen can have a delay. Um, it auto refreshes uh, every, I wanna say, <laughs> it might be every 15 minutes if you don't turn this auto refresh for five minutes on. So we recommend that you do that so that um, the student status is being automatically updated without you having to think about it every five minutes. But then you can also click on the circles of arrows button that is the refresh now button. If you, for example, have just reseated a student and you wanna make sure that they have returned to in progress status, you can click on that refresh now button and it will bring up the most current status for that student and all the other students on the list. So good to know. Um, Sometimes we have proctors who are hesitant to refresh because they're worried that it's reseeding the students or refreshing the test or something, but um, that really is just for what's listed here on the screen about the student's status. When the student is submitted, for example, here, um, where it says 100% attempted, that means that the student attempted every question um, if it says something less than that, they might have not answered every question. This one is to talk about the text-to-speech column, and this is a toggle. Um, it will be on if the student was already indicated to have text-to-speech, um, and Krista talked about that, making sure that in their student profile that is enabled with their accommodations. Um, and when you see the student proctor group, then if they've been indicated in their student profile ahead of time to have Texas speech, that will be on, which is um, sort of the, the status view that you see in this yellow box at the top where it's, it's blue with the white circle to the right hand side. Um, that means Texas speech is on, but sometimes there's a student who's supposed to be getting text-to-speech and for whatever reason it isn't in their profile um, ahead of time. And so 
uh, they can, it can be turned on um, by the, uh, it, it can be turned on only for the session. Um, and so if that student was not pre-indicated in their profile to get Texas speech, but they're supposed to, you can turn it off for the session, but then we recommend you go back and indicate it in their um, profile so that when the next session is launched, they do have Texas speech already turned on for them. If you had to, you could do it just as the session for session one and session two. But again, we really recommend that um, if it's if it's not turned on and it should be, it can be turned on if that student is is eligible um, for text to speech. But then we recommend that the DAC or SAC go in and make sure that the student record, the student profile in the system has that turned on um, at that level. In the accommodations column, there is, uh, if there's a number, you can hover over that and that's what's showing in this top right yellow box where there's a, a screenshot of a hover over the number one and it shows that that's a Texas speech accommodation, but it might be extended time. It might be um, one of the other indicators that can be turned on a small group uh, for example, and, and that would be listed there. So that will help proctors know which students need to have those accommodations and make sure that they are accounted for before testing. Um, if the student is receiving a paper test, and this is new this year, they will there will be a, a red button underneath the code column that says paper only. And this is the only thing that you'll see appearing in that code column um, for any student is if they are paper student, that red button will say paper only. And that lets you know that they will not be entering responses online. They will need to have that paper test in front of them to take the test. And um, then that paper test gets sent back for uh, scoring by the vendor. Responses are not added for the science assessment into the online form at the local level. So if the student tries to, if you use a test code to, and the student's ID to attempt to log into the online version of this test, it, if that student has a paper only designation, they will get a special, there will be a, a warning message and we'll actually see what that looks like in the screens coming up. But um, there will be an announcement that the test is blocked and the student is prevented from taking the test online because that student needs to have the paper test. This screen is showing uh, that if they are in progress, um, it is giving you the item number one of 18. Um, so you'll have the percent attempted when it's submitted um, and the item will be visible. The, the number out of how many items on the test will be visible in that item column if they are in progress. On the far right hand side of the Proctor dashboard, there are action buttons. Um, these are for pausing the test, resuming the test if it has been paused, and reseating students. And um, at the top of the actions column, it, there are blue buttons, and that is to pause, resume, or reseat all of the students in the session. So that might need to be used if you're in the middle of testing and there is a fire drill um, and the test needs to be paused for all students at once. Um, you would use that button. And then to resume, um, you can resume for all students. The reseat all then is uh, not as common uh, a scenario. Most of the time with your reseating, it's a one student at a time. And we'll, we will be going through some details here on how to reseat students. But um, to see the buttons for the student action options, 
you would go to the menu of three dots that's at the far right hand side of each student's uh, row of information. And when you click on that, it expands. And that's shown here. There's sort of a box that's opened up that says actions. And then there's a graphic and pause session and another graphic and receipt session. Those are the student action buttons. And that's where you would go to, to receipt a student. So that is the touring, what options are available to you under the actions section of the Proctor dashboard. Next screen. And what appears in that box um, with the three dots menu uh, will depend on the student's progress or testing status. So if they've not started, there will be no actions available to you there for that individual student. If they have submitted the test already, um, there will also be no actions for you to take as the proctor. If they are in progress, then there'll be the pause or receipt options available through that menu with three dots. And this, these screen, sorry, back one for just a second. Um, these screens show shot so the example of no activity. So if a student is idle for too long and there's no activity, then uh, they will need to be reseated to resume the testing and most likely. And um, that's so as you're proctoring, you can look for that if they've been idle with not touching anything on the screen, not placing their cursor anywhere or taking any action on the screen for too long, they can get timed out um, and may need to be reseated. But again, we'll go over that when we talk about reseating. And which is now. Um, so there are a couple different scenarios um, where you may need to reseat students or proctors may need to reseat students. Um, as we were just talking about, if it's idle for too long, they've timed out, sometimes it's the network is too slow. Um, if you're having an internet disruption uh, at the school and the system can't communicate um, back to the main servers, um, it will put the students into a mode where they will need to be reseated to continue. We do also see sometimes student accidentally closes the test window. There is a, a little X up in the corner of their testing screen and sometime for whatever reasons, kids will click that even though um, they don't really mean to or should be closing the test window and they would need to be reseated. Um, the other is we are taking the test with a lockdown browser running and the test can only be taken by using the lockdown browser. And that lockdown browser is there in part to detect, um, prevent students from accessing unallowed programs at the same time as test administration is active. So if a student does a certain combination of keystrokes or attempts to launch another program in the background, um, that will close the, the test session and prevent them from testing. And they would need to be reseated to reopen the test for them. Next slide. Um, when we looked at, you would go to the student's individual uh, row and click on those three dots to open up the action menu and select receipt the student. You will get this box that's at the, the top um, that just ensures that you want to receipt the student and then you would click to receipt them and their status would change to receipted, um, which is what's showing down there with the red arrow at the bottom of the page. You'll get a similar box if you are reseating all students at once. Are you sure you want to receipt all and you would say yes or cancel? Um, sometimes if the student is unable to get into their test and reseating does not resolve that. Um, it's outside of the scenarios that we talked about before. Then uh, it could be that their student, that their test has already been submitted. Um, and if that's the case, then 
unsubmitting a test, reopening a test in any way requires approval from Maine Department of Education. And so you can um, contact the help desk and we'll work with you to contact Krista to get approval. Some other messages that you may get um, that we just wanted to go over for during test administration. Um, sometimes there are warning messages that come up when launching the lockdown browser. So at the very beginning of students opening up the test um, before they've even entered their uh, test code and student ID, um, there are some things that the lockdown browser is designed to detect. Um, if and you may get little boxes like what's showing here sort of on the left hand side with the graphic in it that says there's a network issue. So it will it will tell you if the internet connection is non-existent or too slow. Um, it'll also give a, a pop up that looks sort of like that if there are other applications that are running in the background. Um, if you attempt to launch the test and they're still running a web browser or um, they're logged into a, a student um, course management system on that computer, you know, or whatever, it will say that there are other things running and need to be shut down. Um, it'll also give you this alert if the, if the device does not have enough battery power. Um, and some of these will basically stop tests, prevent you from logging in, um, but others uh, like the battery power, the student can still log in um, and still take the test, but it does give you that warning that the system does not detect sufficient battery power and you probably wanna plug it in before starting the test. Um, you may get a warning that there's too many monitors. If there are other external monitors connected to the student's test taking device, um, the, there, the rule here is that there can only be one monitor at a time um, or one screen showing the test at any one time. So you can't have it set up for, for multiple monitor setup. Um, there is a specification for as an accommodation if a student needs to be using an external monitor that is uh, for large setup for their um, visual accommodation, then the screen on the laptop has to be disabled so that only that one monitor that is the approved accommodation monitor is in use during the testing. Um, some other things, insufficient memory, low resolution, uh, are also things that won't prevent the student from logging in, but you might see pop up as a, um, as a warning. Um, this Microsoft Edge issues is something that's kind of new this year. Um, if, the, if you are using Microsoft Edge, you won't be using it for taking the test because only the lockdown browser can run the test. But if you're using Windows devices and Edge is something that students are using during instruction, um, Microsoft Edge itself has uh, some programs that can run in the background that will prevent, even if you don't have it actively open on the student's desktop, it can um, still be preventing the test from opening. And so there's detailed information in our manuals about how to uh, disable Microsoft Edge running in the background so that the lockdown browser can launch. So I just wanted to make a note about the external monitor. So that falls under the designated supports that you do not need to report to us. So if that's something a student needs, you are welcome to use it. And if you do run into any issues with getting your external monitor to work the way you want it to, just reach out to the science support desk. All right, there is a separate lockdown browser manual um, that has this information also in it with uh, additional details. So warning messages that might pop up when you um, are launched, when the student is launching the test, the one says that the student is not found. And usually the resolution for that is that uh, the test code or the student's ID has been mistyped um, into 
the screen and so just need to double check what is the correct test code, what's the correct SSID, and um, I'm sorry, at this point, it would just be the student ID. So uh, just check to make sure that the correct one was entered and that resolves most of the problems. Um, otherwise, check the student roster. If they were not actually rostered to the test, um, then you would need to go back to your classes and add the student to, the cl to a class um, before they will be detected to launch a test. If the error says that the test is not found, a different one of these reddish uh, blocks that pops up, um, again, it's usually that the test code was misentered, so just changing that um, and just double check the code on the test ticket. Make sure you're in the right session also um, for the right test ticket for the right session. If the warning message says the test is already in session, um, that is generally an indicator if the student is still needing to test um, that they need to be reseated. So those scenarios that we talked about, they accidentally close the testing window they go to log back in, they, they launch the browser again and go to log back in and enter their credentials and they get this, that the test is already in session. It means that they have not yet been reseated after the, um, the session display had been closed down. So uh, if they should still be testing, you can reseat the student and then try again, you'll want to check your proctor dashboard to make sure you've reseeded them properly and then um, they can log back in again and they should not get that warning message anymore. Um, and then their box might say that this session has already been submitted and that is that means that the tests has been completed, has been the, the student clicked on the submit button it can also, sessions get submitted on auto submit at the end of every day. So if a test session was left open, the student didn't complete it um, during school hours, it does get auto submitted at the end of the next day. And again, if a student needs to get back into a test that's already been submitted, then you'll need to contact the help desk because it requires approval from MDOE. And then if there is a message that says the test is blocked, that is that uh, student with a paper test use case that we talked about earlier. Um, they will not be entering an online response. They will need to have their paper test booklet. So the last step we're talking about here is uh, viewing and exporting the student rosters and uh, printing out test tickets. <clears throat> um, back to our admin card, which again, you get to from your main menu under test management and then under administrations. And on that card, um, you can view the roster details of the students in the administration. If you click on view, that opens up that uh, student list view that we saw a screenshot of earlier uh, that allows you to, to view and search for students, um, see their progress on screen. Uh, but then you can also export using the export button there in the center. That will download to your computer a CSV spreadsheet, and then you can uh, filter and sort that as you would any other spreadsheet once it's on your on your device. And um, again, just to see the rosters, you can also view proctor group details. Similarly, by clicking on the view button, that will open up the proctor detail page with uh, all that information on screen, or you can export a spreadsheet of proctor group enrollments um, that you can use and sort in other ways from your computer. And that's what these look like. Uh, the, the top screenshot is the student detail page, the roster there. And then the bottom screenshot is the proctor group detail page.
And then to print out test cards and proctor cards, um, you'll use that print card, print card button, um, either from the students menu or the proctor group menu. And um, there are a variety of options. You'll get a, a window that opens that looks like the, the screenshot that is on the lower part of the screen. And um, up in that corner under where it says layout, you can choose different ways of preparing those cards, laying them out for printing onto paper on your local printer. And um, there's options to see the test cards, just one per page or for um, uh, like a three by six. I think what we're showing here in the screenshot is the two by four. Um, so there's different op options for, for how many test cards per page, things like that. Um, you can and you can organize them in a couple of different ways by choosing to stack them or do them sequentially. Um, you can also choose the, the proctor groups that they're in and uh, print out that way. The big green button is what you'll click then to actually send them to the printer and you'll get your own print dialog box from there. Um, you can also, there's an option that gives you a, a title page, and that's what's showing in the top box, um, top screenshot there. It has the test code and proctor code for each proctor group, very large, easy to see, and then the list of students and their accommodations. So it's sort of the, the summary page. Uh, of the proctor group detail that is sometimes uh, easier to use for test administration day to have handy. Next slide. All right, I think that is the end of the overview about the proctoring and accessing student rosters, printing test cards. So um, there's a lot of information available for you to follow up on at the support desk. Um, if you're needing immediate assistance, you can call or chat. Um, so a number of different options there. Should we go ahead and take questions? Yeah, so there's a question in the chat. It says, do the sessions have to be administered in order? For example, for students who are absent for a session, can they take the same session the rest of the students are on for the day they return and then make up the one missed at a later time? Yes, definitely. So the only session they have to take last is the questionnaire, session four, and that's because it asks them about their experience during the rest of the main science assessment. But otherwise, if a student is absent for sessions one and two and they come back for session three, they can take session three with the rest of their peer group and then make up sessions one and two. And that might be a scenario where you want to move them and make a new proctor group for them um, that so you can track them as testing on a different day and with a different test code and you know. Yeah, so makeup groups are a nice time to use that additional proctor group tool although not required. <laughs> exactly. Susan, this question is for you. How long does a pause button hold? For example, do we use this for fire drills or bathroom breaks? I think it pauses for quite a while. You might have to reseat students if it's paused for too long. Procedurally, breaks would come at the end of a set, in between sessions rather than in the middle of a session, but I'll let Krista answer that. <laughs> You know, if it's a true emergency and you don't have time to press the pause button, right? Closing a device does the same thing. It it closes it. And in terms of if a student needs a break, whether that's a student with frequent breaks or they have to take a bathroom break right now, they can also exit the assessment temporarily from their own screen. So that's something that they can do independently as well. And when they come back, they log back in and you'll likely have to hit that receipt button. And um, if the student session is paused, it will actually change their screen. And there's information about this in the um, test administration manual. But um, and so that's good to look for when you're proctoring. If you if you are pausing screens or if the student is pausing, um, 
then it's good to make sure that this, you know, that you can verify that it's paused because the status of the screen will change um, and say that the test is paused so that they're not leaving their test open if they're walking away from the device to go use the restroom or whatever. And um, it, you know, it's a test security measure uh, for that. Um, and then, but it can delay, it can, there can be a little bit of a delay if the proctor hits that pause button, it might not uh, go through to the students instantaneously, depending on your network speed. So sometimes there's a few seconds delay and, but it should, the student will see something pop up on their screen that says the test has been paused by the proctor. Yep. You know, so these are the, the ways to contact us for any kind of technical support, Adam platform use, issues with rostering, things like that. If there are questions about the assessment overall or assessment policy, those will go to Krista. And um, information about that is there on the screen, how to make that contact. Um, and then we also just like to note that there, it is a unique help desk just for the main science program um, and that the math and reading assessments have their own separate help desk. Uh, so you can get the most direct and specific help if you come to the main science help desk when you need it.